So, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, or maybe good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so, let me briefly remind you uh, the rules uh, for so we which we uh, use for the convenience of the interaction with the speaker and discussion. So, uh, we uh, ask you to keep your microphones and videos turned off by default. Uh, you will be able to switch on your microphone. You may ask questions uh, in two ways. Uh, you can either raise your hand and uh, we will interrupt the speaker uh, at some point, or you may also type your questions to the chat. Uh, so the speaker, uh, and we will also see the, uh, this question. And at some point, uh, hopefully, this question will be answered. So uh, I'm very happy. Uh, to introduce our today's speaker, it is Andrei Bogdanov from the Department of Physics and Engineering at the University. And he will be talking about the multiplexing and steering of guided light with the electric antennas. Andrei, please. Okay, Anton, uh, thank you for, for the introduction, dear colleagues. Thank you for joining this seminar. So, my talk uh, will be devoted to the multiplexing and steering of the guided light with the electric antennas. So, uh, you know, maybe the, the most uh, studied and the most uh, beautiful example of the guided light is surface plasma polariton. And surface plasma polariton, in, in the simplest case, is just surface electromagnetic wave propagating along the interface, interface between air and some, some plasmonic, some metal, yeah, in the simplest case. It could be also semiconductor, for example, and you could replace air with a subdielectric. But this is a, some general view of the characteristic view of the dispersion of surface plasma polariton. So dependence of, of the frequency of surface plasma polariton on the uh, propagation number, so wave vector component along the interface. So this is a, omega capital is a, is a plasma frequency and we can see the dispersion of uh, surface wave as any uh, guided light is under the light line. It means that it's impossible to excite surface plasma polariton from uh, free space uh, by plane waves in linear regime. It's possible in non-linear regime, but in linear regime it's impossible because uh, the incident photons have not enough in plane momentum to, to excite, to provide phase matching or just momentum conservation. Yeah? So it is why uh, people use some, uh, uh, some tools for excitation surface plasma polariton. This is a, some a classical method of uh, SPP excitation. Uh, first method is kind of uh, frustrated or attenuated total reflection method. So additional mom momentum comes from the prism because the high index prism from high index dielectric material increases the momentum of incident light. This is a so-called so auto geometry. So the additional uh, momentum in plane momentum could come from the periodic structures from, from lattice because the lattice can bring an additional momentum e uh, equal to the reciprocal lattice vector. So, and we could have a so phase matching condition here. So, and the, uh, another example, this is much close to, to the uh, topic of my presentation, is the using some defects, like a notch, or maybe something, a uh, sc small scatterer, because this scatterer and this notch uh, can have uh, near fields, they definitely have near fields. It means that uh, Fourier spectrum of the near field uh, contains uh, almost all possible uh, wave numbers, uh, uh, even uh, with a high, even, even under the light line. So, and with some efficiency, we, we could excite uh, SPP wave. These are some cl classical methods. So, but the question we're trying to answer in this work, uh, is it possible to excite surface plasma polariton with a single nanoparticle efficiently and controllably. Okay, let's go. So, uh, and there are a lot of different uh, so so called not classical method for excitation, but uh, some of them is uh, today is, is quite quite classical. This is a, a very beautiful example how it's possible to excite SPP using this lead and using the uh, circularly polarized light. It's it's about control of excitation direction. So in this work. Uh, the, the SPP could be excited to the left or to the right side of the sleeve, depending on the polarization of the incident light. Yeah. So 
Uh, it's also possible to excite SPP by rotating dipole using the spin momentum blocking. So uh, it's also possible to excite it to either forward or backward direction. Uh, also, one can use uh, some nano antennas, like uh, in this paper, the magnetic nano antennas for or Yagiuda antenna for directional excitation of SPP. Okay. Also, it's a, in, it's a uh, potentially um, uh, very prospective to realize some uh, nanophotonic demultiplexers for for guided light, in, in particular for surface plasma polarity. In this work, the uh, focusing and the multiplexing of SPP is realized using the phase array antenna. This is like some particles uh, uh, cover uh, uh, placed on, 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 some, on some metal. And this is a phase array and incident lights come from the grating and one can see in, uh, here that uh, SPP with, uh, with different wavelengths of uh, focused in different spots. Yeah. So in this work also it's possible to uh, this is some nano antenna, some micro disc with a with a defect, and uh, it's possible to excite uh, guided light to the left or to the right depending on the wavelength of the incident light. So this is some some examples, but there are a lot of them. So we'll, so it will take uh, uh, much time to to overview all, all the works, but this is uh, in my opinion one of the most interesting. So, but what we, are, uh, we will do in, in, uh, in this work, we will use for excitation of surface plasma polaritons uh, all directed uh, particles with high refractive index, like silicon, gallium phosphide, aluminum, gallium arsenide. So refractive index usually is about 3.5. And characteristic feature of uh, these uh, uh, particles, that incident wave uh, could excite not only uh, electric dipole moment. It could excite also magnetic dipole moment and they are orthogonal uh, in the simplest case of a sphere. So it means that this particle is characterized not only by electric response but also by uh, magnetic response. So there is no magic that there is a, some um, uh, magnetic response in uh, at the optical frequencies. It could be um, understood in the following way. So uh, we know that the incident wave will polarize our particles. So in each point of our particle, we will have some polarization, some dipole moment per unit volume. So in order to calculate the dipole moment of the particle, we need just to integrate the polarization over the whole volume of the particle. So it's also possible to calculate the magnetic dipole moment using this simple formula. So it means that in order to have the magnetic dipole moment, uh, we should have some vortex of polarization. So in this uh, vortex uh, of polarization it appears in the, in, in the following way. So let's imagine that uh, here I plot the direction uh, and polarization of the incident wave. And this is by my particle. And this is the wavelength uh, in, inside uh, in the material with the same refractive index as, as my nanoparticle. So, and when the wavelength inside the material is comparable with the size of my particle with the diameter, one can see that <clears throat> this part of the wave polarized particle in this direction and this part <clears throat> of the plane wave will polarize the particle in opposite direction. So we will have some kind of vertex and, and this vertex results in, in appearance of a magnetic dipole response. So there is, there is no, no magic. So this is just a characteristic uh, field distribution for the magnetic dipole and electric dipole resonances. So it is important that electric and magnetic responses uh, have resonant behavior. So you could, you could uh, observe this response only at specific frequency. Yeah, the, this uh, resonance is characterized by field distribution, by quality factor, but this is a fundamental resonance. And uh, quartical is quite small, so the characteristic uh, quality factor not so big. It's around uh, 10, something like this. Okay. And this interference between electric and magnetic response in, uh, of the single particles results in a very beautiful phenomena. One of them is a so-called uh, Huygens element, a Kerker condition. So when the, uh, this is a, a electric polarizability and magnetic polarizability of my particle, and if they have the same phase and the same amp amplitude, uh, in this case, uh, we could cancel 
the back scattering of the particles. So we have only the forward scattering. This is a so-called uh, perfect Huygens element. So, and this condition is called character condition. But it's also possible to realize the situation when the signs of electric and magnetic responses are opposites. So in this case, uh, we will have uh, the predominant back scattering. Of course, we, we still have some forward scattering because it's impossible to scatter forward scattering <clears throat> according to the optical theorem. Okay, uh, this is how, how it works for uh, typical uh, dielectric particles like from silicon, gallium phosphide. This is our, uh, the dashed curve in the scattering cross section uh, measured in the ge geometrical cross sections. So one can see that uh, uh, characteristic uh, extinction cross section is, is about 10. Yeah. So uh, this is a, the red curve correspond to the magnetic. Uh, resonance and uh, uh, blue curve correspond to the uh, electric dipole resonance. So one can see that there are two, two crossings. Uh, these crossings, in this uh, crossing, we have uh, uh, anti Kerker condition because uh, this frequency is between the resonances, and I'm in phase with one resonance and uh, and uh, in anti phase with second resonance. So this is for anti kerker condition, and here I have a realization of Kerkin condition. So and this was realized experimentally using the single particles and uh, meta surfaces. So it means that it's possible to fabricate the um, meta surface with a, from high refractive index materials, and this meta surface will be completely uh, transparent for incident light at some specific frequencies. This is experimental results, and one can see that in this, in, in this region we have a complete uh, transmittance okay sorry, sorry questions are questions allowed during the presentation sure yeah if the questions are allowed please answer how the um, electric polarizability and magnetic polarizability can have uh, opposite signs if in both of them imaginary part must have the same sign due to passivity yes th uh, thank you very much for uh, for your question of course so uh, the uh, true or effective polarizability, which accounting uh, the uh, radiation response, I mean that uh, imaginary part uh, could could arise from the uh, absorption, and it's one reason. And second reason is just radiation losses. Yes, because in order to, in order to scatter uh, the field, you need you need uh, to to take some energy from from the incident wave. And definitely, you're absolutely right that they have uh, uh, the imaginary parts. So in this could be just approximately, uh, maybe it's, it's more correct to write here uh, for real parts, not for the uh, total uh, polarizability and for real parts, but this is approximate condition, yeah. Did I answer your question? Absolutely, this is the condition for real parts, thank you. Yes, okay, thank you, okay. Uh -huh. So, and we then we try to uh, extend this uh, Huygens uh, or Kerker condition to the domain of surface wave, because here in, in the in the three D space we could manipulate with a uh, with a scattering direction using the uh, uh, this uh, this principle this interference, but in their uh, domain of surface waves in two two D photonics, uh, this situation becomes more rich. And let me show you. Let me consider the uh, simple the following geometry. This is a some metal substrate and a, a small dielectric particle placed on on this substrate. And I will consider some incident wave. In my case, the incident wave has uh, is a, a TM polarized or P polarized. It means that a magnetic field uh, is along y direction and electric field has two components <coughs> x and z. So in this case. Uh, I, uh, I will have uh, three non-zero dipole uh, moments, three, three components, two components of the uh, electric dipole moments, this one and this one, and uh, magnetic dipole moments, M, Y. And I will interesting in, in propagation of uh, surface plasma polariton along some certain direction, which is characterized by angle phi, uh, phi node, yeah, this one. So this problem can be solved analytically uh, completely analytically uh, in the dipole approximation when I, I will I will uh, replace this particle with a point dipole 
uh, with their electric and magnetic response characterized by the electric magnetic polarizabilities. In this case, problem could be solved analytically. This is just an expression for the uh, total uh, magnetic field. So I need to know the, the green function, electric and magnetic green functions. Uh, and uh, I need to know also exact uh, values of uh, electric, electric and magnetic uh, uh, dipole moments. And these magnetic dipole moments uh, are counted interaction particle with the substrate. So we, we, we will solve self-consistent problem. It's also possible to do. It's a well-known technique. And uh, I will skip uh, this cumbersome uh, 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 mathematical equations. I will show you only the result. This is an expression for the uh, magnetic field of SPP. So magnetic field lies somewhere in plane because uh, when the SPP propagates in some direction, it, uh, it has uh, two components of magnetic field, uh, X and Y. This expression. So, uh, and these factors are described the angular behavior of uh, SPP. One can see that SPP could be excited uh, by MY, PX, and uh, PZ component of the magnetic field. Okay, this is the expression for intensity. So it seems that here I, I skip the uh, PZ, which is also a factor like a Z component of the uh, electric dipole moment. So this, uh, if, if you know the magnetic field, of course, you could cal easily calculate the intensity of SPP in certain direction. And in this case, this is, is given by this sim simple example. Here I have this, uh, this PZ component. So uh, uh, kappa is a, a, a uh, inverse, uh, inverse penetration depth of SPP field into the air, normalized by K node. And uh, K uh, SPP with tilde is a, just a propagation constant of SPP normalized by K node. Okay, so I have some question I see. Uh, it is calculation for semi, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, we will provide calculation for semi-infinite uh, substrate, uh, and, uh, but usually uh, penetration depth in, of SPP into the plasmonic substrate is about uh, 20 nanometers. So actually this model works well uh, for the thicknesses of the substrate around uh, like, 50 or 100 nanometers, or uh, 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 10 or, or 20 nanometers penetration depth. So for 50 nanometers, it, it works also well. And rho here is a radial coordinate uh, uh, measured. So the distance between the origin here, between the particle and some certain point. This is a rho. One can see that intensity decays as one over rho, uh, because it's cylindrical wave, the excite cylindrical surface plasma polarity. Okay. So, and this expression could be a little bit modified expression. And one can see uh, uh, it's possible to, to introduce the so called Z parameter, and Z parameter uh, in the following form. So, it's like a, some combination of electric uh, and magnetic dipole moments, of, uh, inverse penetration depth, and uh, propagation wave number of SPP. So some complex parameter, yeah. And one can see that it's interesting that uh, angular distribution of SPP is defined only by this single parameter. So in order to define the directivity pattern, yeah, uh, to describe the angular distribution of SPP intensity, you need to know just a, a single parameter. Okay, I see some question. Uh, uh, the question is following. It is a field representation for observation points on the surface. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Konstantin, for answering this question to you. Okay. And, uh, and using this, this simple equation uh, uh, and this single parameter, it is easy to analyze the angular distribution depending on this complex parameter. And we found the followings that uh, this is our uh, parameter is very similar uh, to that we have in 3D space for Kerker and anti Kerker condition. L let me show you. As, as you know, if you consider SPP at low frequencies, in this case, SPP behaves like, like a, a plain electromagnetic wave in free space. And dispersion is very similar, it's almost uh, linear. Yeah. 
And when uh, the, uh, you consider SPP at low frequencies, uh, the kappa parameter uh, goes to zero because uh, in, in low frequencies, uh, SPP has very long tail uh, inside air and uh, KSPP is all normalized KSPP is almost one. And in long wave length limit regime, that uh, goes to uh, this simple value. It's a ratio of uh, the magnetic and electric dipole response. So, uh, and if this parameter equal to one or, uh, one or minus one, if it's equal to one, we could cancel the forward scattering. And if it equal to minus one, uh, we can cancel the backward scattering of SPP. So it means that in order to realize the directional excitation, we need to manipulate with electric and magnetic resonances in a way to have this parameter equal to one or minus one. And we will analyze the directivity. The directivity is, uh, 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 is introduced in the following way. You usually it's uh, widely used in uh, microwave physics and in antenna theory. So, but in our case, we will consider two decays. Uh, directivity is a dimensionless parameter. It is a function of the uh, excitation direction of azimuthal angle phi node. And this is defined as uh, the ratio of SPP intensity in certain direction uh, at, uh, at the angle phi node divided by the average intensity over uh, the whole uh, angles. So you could put this two pi in the denominator and you will see that in the denominator we will have exactly the average value of, of the intensity. Okay, so this is the main parameter that we will analyze further, directivity. And the maximal directivity in the dipole approximation in 2D case equal to three. So in order to have the higher directivity, you need to, to account higher uh, multiples like a quadrupole, octopoles, and, and, and others. So, and using this analytical model, uh, we calculate the forward directivity, so we fixed uh, uh, angle equal to, equal to zero, and we, and we calculate uh, the directivity in the forward direction as a function of angle of incidence here and as a function of wavelength. So, and here you see, oh, I, I, I have two questions, let me answer from Ivan Sinov. Uh, I am from Kirill, uh, from Kirill Koshulev question. Uh, why in, in the long wavelength image case PP uh, uh, disappears from the denominator? Ah, case PP because it's Kirill, it's normalized. It's normalized by K node, and K, K node is a, a dispersion in air. So and uh, case PP uh, it's also equal to K node. Okay. Uh, so next question. Uh, ah, it's uh, it's answer from the one Sinov. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for answering some questions in, in chat. Okay, go back to, to this beautiful map. Uh, the color shows the directivity. One can see it changes from zero to three to maximal value in the dipole approximation. This map is calculated uh, analytically. So, and one can see that it's possible to find the, some certain angle of incidence and some certain wavelength when the forward directivity is maximal. But if, if it is important that if the forward directivity is maximal, it doesn't matter that, that the backward directivity is zero. And this uh, black point shows the uh, back, uh, zero of the uh, back, backward scattering. So one can see that is quite close, yeah? In order to realize cancellation of back scattering or to realize maximization of forward scattering, we need to take different angles and wavelength. Uh, close to each other, but different. And then we calculated the same map, but not for the forward directivity, for backward directivity. This is the map for backward directivity as a function of incident angle f by f length again. And here you see that the maximal backward directivity uh, realized is here, but uh, the zero forward directivity is here. So this black point corresponds to the uh, center of this dark region here. So, and these analytical calculations uh, help us to choose parameters for, for the experiment. So, in order to realize the switching, uh, the, fast, uh, the switching of the directivity, uh, uh, we need to, to be uh, somewhere here in this region. 
uh, where the directivity changes drastically. So we will choose the angle of incidence around 25 degrees and we will change our wavelength in, in this region uh, from 800 nanometers up, up to uh, one micron. Okay, here. Okay, so this is the main idea of, of the multiplexer, how this, uh, this uh, be, uh, background physics uh, can help to, to provide the multiplexing. So if we have the incident wave uh, consisting of two different wavelengths, and if the non-antenna is tuned for the uh, one wave for forward, to realize forward scattering and for the uh, second wavelength to realize backward scattering, we will have the situation when the uh, incident light consisting of two uh, different wavelengths will excite SPP in opposite directions and you will have the multiplexing uh, using this single nanoparticle and, uh, uh, for, and uh, SPP. So I have some question from uh, Ivan Toftul. How could for directivity be zero? It means optical theorem. Ivan, this is 2D case and optical theorem doesn't work here. It is it's exactly, it is, uh, this is a difference of this 2D case from 3D. In this case, it is possible to come in dipole approximation. It's possible to completely cancel forward or backward directivity. So uh, this, this is the difference with 3D case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some question, what if you, some, some question, uh, what if you do consider, uh, do not consider dipole approximation, of course. So the main difference is if I will account higher order multiples, I will discuss a little bit further uh, using the uh, uh, full wave numerical simulation, but it's possible to realize higher directivity uh, at uh, shorter wavelengths uh, when the higher multiples will, uh, will, will be excited. So, and of course, the, in, uh, beyond the dipole approximation, the analytical uh, description uh, quite cumbersome. You need to take uh, to account interference of many, many uh, components. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk is it due to, to, to 2D instead of 3D? Or it's due to, it's due to the, it's because of the substrate. So you, uh, actually the, we break the optical theorem, classical uh, optical theorem, just because of, because of the substrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Particle scattering still can have it while well, because the total scatter uh, total scattering uh, is contributed not only by excitation of SPP. Of course, we also have some that, uh, scattering of the, uh, uh, this particle into the free space. Yeah, and I counted only uh, one channel corresponding to SPP here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Juan. I will I will go. There. So this is about fabrication. So uh, in order to, uh, to, to fabricate, uh, to, for fabrication, this nanoantenna, we use laser ablation technique. And this uh, nanoantenna uh, nan uh, was fabricated in Itmo University. So this is the diameter of nanoantenna, it's about 300 nanometers. Then uh, we take the metallic tip in order to replace our particle uh, from one substrate uh, to, to, the, to the plasmonic substrate. And now uh, I will show you uh, how, how it looks. So uh, this is a video, but uh, in this video, this is a tip of, of uh, uh, atomic microscope here. Yeah? And uh, this is a small particle which we will transfer from one substrate to another one. We will pick the particle with metallic tip, transfer it, and then uh, pick it, pick it, uh, place it at uh, uh, another substrate. So this technique is called pick and place. Okay, let's have a look at this beautiful video. We just uh, pick the particle, pick up the, pick the particle up and place it to some, another place. So actually for me, this, uh, uh, this looks absolutely amazing. This is like a SpaceX uh, rocket landing here. It's, a, it's, it's, it's just this scale bar is just 100 nanometers. So uh, it's uh, this uh, movie uh, w uh, was shot in, uh, in the chamber of uh, 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 scanning collector micros microscope. Yeah. So, okay. Let's go further. 
So about the measurements. So uh, how can we measure the directivity? So uh, we will measure the directivity using the uh, back focal play technique. Let me explain briefly how we measure. So this is a uh, sample. So we consider a silicon particle placed on the plasmonic substrate here. And in, in, in our case, the uh, plasmonic substrate is uh, not semi-infinite, yeah? it, it has a finite thickness. And we will uh, calculate the optimal thickness in, uh, from the following reason. Uh, the thickness of this plasmonic substrate should be thin and, uh, or thick enough in order to SPP uh, uh, is excited only at the upper interface in order to avoid contribution of SPP from, from the lower interface. So you need to take thick enough. But from other hand, uh, you need to take SPP substrate thin enough uh, in order to have some uh, radiation leakage into the substrate. Yeah? Uh, and our system has a translation symmetry, so we have a conservation of in-plane momentum, and uh, our SPP wave hum, uh, our SPP wave have uh, has small uh, leakage r radiation with a certain wave number which it conserves because of the uh, plane symmetry, and then uh, we will detect this uh, photon. Uh, leakage at certain angle by CCD metrics placed in the back uh, focal plane. Okay, I'm sorry, just a moment. Okay. So, uh, it means that uh, each photon radiate or, uh, which uh, radiate in a, in a sp at specific angle of incidence, yeah, will be observed by CCD metrics, by a specific pixel of CCD metrics. So, and we uh, will just uh, take, take a photo. Uh, we take a photo of, uh, uh, of the image of the particle or in a um, Fourier plane. Uh, this is how it looks like. So this is a, a Fourier plane. The coordinates of, of this uh, photo is a KX and KY. This plane is called Fourier plane, yeah. Uh, this circle exactly corresponds to the uh, uh, wave number of SPP. So, and the color uh, corresponds to the number of photons absorbed by a specific pixel of CCD metric. So, the, wh where we have a white region, we have some uh, uh, absorption. So, and uh, from this measurement, it is possible to retrieve uh, the uh, their activity in each uh, specific direction. So, uh, and let, this is a wavelength. Now I will show you a video. I will change the wavelength of the incident light. And I will change the wavelength. I, I will show you uh, how the directivity pattern, uh, pattern will switch from forward to backward, okay? Let's have a look. This is a back focal plane image. One can see it's, it's a wavelength. It's a forward, 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 backward. We increase the wavelength, it's again, it's again forward. So uh, by this simple experiment, we have shown that it's possible to realize uh, switching from forward directivity to backward directivity, changing only the wavelength of the incident light. Okay, some questions, let me have a look. Okay, no questions here, yeah, okay. This is our uh, results of the experiment. So uh, this are the same maps, but plotted in the inverse colors. So uh, using this experimental data, we calculated average intensity and we calculate, calculated intensity in a specific direction and uh, taking the ratio of these values, we retrieve the directivity pattern for SPP wave. So for the wavelength 890 nanometers, we will have a more pure forward uh, uh, for forward excitation of, of, of SPP. The solid curve corresponds to the analytical calculation and this uh, uh, bold curve corresponds to the experimental data. Let me ask, I think there's some question. Is it the spot in the second, is it white spot? Okay, I will show you. So, uh, yes, Ivan, thank you for this question about this spot. Actually, this spot corresponds to the 
uh, incident wave. Let's uh, go back to the experimental setup. I will show you experimental setup here because we also have some incident wave, incident and the angle 25 degree, yeah, 25 degree. So in Fourier space, because it's plane wave, and in the Fourier space, this plane wave uh, will uh, represent it as a delta function at, a, uh, at, at some uh, wave number corresponding to the angle of incidence 25 degrees. And in order, and this is very, very bright spot, yeah, because the incident wave uh, is quite intensive. And in order to get rid, uh, the feature comes from this incident wave. Here we use so-called a beam blocker. So in, in the intermediate Fourier plane, we just uh, put uh, so-called some, some beam blocker and, and the final Fourier plane, uh, we will not see this uh, uh, bright characteristic feature uh, coming from the incident wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, uh, the question from Ivan was, uh, uh, what, is this, uh, what is this spot yeah, here? This corresponds to the uh, just incident wave, yeah? Okay, uh, and if you will change the uh, wavelength of the incident light just for uh, 45 degree, or for 45 nanometers, you see, from, uh, 800, from 890 to 935 nanometers, we will see the complete switching from the forward scattering regime to backward scattering regime, yeah? And this is some, uh, if we increase the wavelength further, uh, we will see the excitation in uh, both directions. So I have the following question from Ali Kermakov. Let me read it. What is the efficiency of uh, of this uh, plane to surface wave conversion? Uh, how much energy is converted to surface? Alek, I will answer this question in the following slide. I will explain it in, in, in details uh, about e efficiency. Okay. Let's go further. So uh, this, the, uh, the same uh, picture as, as, as the previous slide. And here we plot the uh, forward and backward directivity as a function of incident wave. So, uh, so it means that we fixed the, uh, the, angle, uh, the angle phi node equal to zero in order to have the forward scattering and analyze the directivity in this forward direction as a function of wavelength. One can see that here, at this wavelength, the reactivity is uh, uh, is almost forward, so it's it's uh, it has maximal value number uh, equal to three, uh, maximal for dipole approximation, uh, and then it drop up to zero, and then it increases. And solid curve corresponds to the analytical model, and these dots correspond to the experimental data. And blue curve, uh, blue co color corresponds to the backward directivity. Again, solid curve for analytical model and uh, uh, these dots uh, for, for the experimental data, okay? It's interesting uh, uh, to hear, to see that this uh, experimental data corresponding to the backward scattering, you see this, uh, uh, have, uh, have the resonant behavior and this resonance is more narrow than in uh, analytical model. So it means that the uh, switching happens and the uh, smaller wavelength interval. So it was, it was a question for us and uh, we uh, thought uh, uh, for some time, uh, why does it happen? And the answer is, is the following. So uh, here you can see that the uh, zero forward to backward directivity is defined by these uh, complex parameters, yes, uh, Z. And uh, in this complex parameter, we have the uh, vertical electric dipole moment in denominator. So actually, if we change the shape of my particle, yeah, for example, we'll consider some ablate or prolate ellipsoid, but not a perfect sphere, we will see that uh, this uh, resonance will more sharper for, for the, uh, for some particles, so for which the PZ component is smaller. So it means that in our case, uh, sphere, it's, it is not a sphere, yeah? Uh, and this is the answer for this question, why we have the more narrow resonances in, exp in experiment than in theory. Okay. 
let's go further. So this is a just uh, result of the calculation of SPP field accounting for the leakage radiation into the substrate. This is the incident wave. Yeah, uh, this is a, a Y component uh, out of plane component of the magnetic field. I mean, perpendicular to, the, to your screen. So, and uh, for the uh, backward scattering, yeah, this one, and for forward scattering. So uh, this is a result of full wave numerical simulation, not uh, of, the, of, the dipole mo of the dipole model. Okay. Uh, the question from Alec about the, the efficiency, but before the efficiency, I would like to, to emphasize the scalability of, of my problem. As we know, the uh, electric and magnetic resonances in the electric particle uh, uh, can, can be scaled. Uh, you need just to change the size of the particle. Your system is linear, and uh, you ch changing the size, you, uh, you, you can shift the position of the magnetic uh, and electric dipole resonances linearly with uh, the size of the particle. And uh, we realized the, uh, this, uh, 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 we measure this forward scattering uh, directivity for the silicon nano antennas of different sizes from uh, 255 nanometers up to 310 nanometers. And one can see that the uh, minimal uh, forward directivity uh, can be realized at different uh, wavelengths. For example, at 800 nanometers up to up to one micron. We need just to uh, change the size of the particle. Okay. Well, the problem is scalable. This is an advantage of these dielectric particles. Okay. And then uh, we compare the e e efficiencies of excitation of SPP for silicon and for gold particles. But what is the efficiency of excitation of SPP? How possible to, to analyze? So it's quite easy. Actually, we can numerically and analytically, we can calculate the amount of energy scattered to SPP. You need just to, uh, to, uh, to calculate the Zomerfeld integral to find the residual corresponding to uh, SPP in the analytical model. And then you could calculate the uh, total intensity of SPP. Uh, this is a, uh, and then you, uh, total amount, amount of energy, yeah? I mean, that's the power uh, of SPP. And then you could divide this uh, power of SPP divided by the uh, energy flex uh, transferred by the incident plane wave. And if you take this ratio, you, you will get just a uh, excitation cross-section of surface plasma polariton. So, and then we could normalize this uh, excitation cross-section of surface plasma polariton by geometrical cross-section of our nano antenna. And we will uh, uh, obtain the efficiency of SPP excitation. And as, as you remember, uh, let me maybe go back a little bit. Let me go back a little bit. I will show you the, uh, this characteristic uh, extinction uh, cross-section, this one. I told you that the uh, extinction cross-section is about uh, 10 geometrical cross-sections yeah, here. So, and the question, and how much geometrical cross-sections uh, correspond to the excitation of SPP? What is a uh, partial, ex uh, partial extinction cross-section uh, corresponding to SPP excitation? Okay, so the, the total uh, extinction cross-section is about uh, 10. And here we see that for silicon particle, this is a, a solid curve. Uh, red one and blue one correspond to the uh, analytical and numerical models, and both of them uh, uh, give uh, close values of efficiency of excitation of SPP. And this is about uh, two or 2.5 uh, geometrical cross sections. So it's, it's, it means that around 25% uh, of extincted energy. Uh, goes to SPP. So it's this, in, the, in these terms, the efficiency uh, is about 25% of, uh, of all extinct energy from, from, from plane wave. So it's quite, quite efficient. So because if you consider some uh, small, I mean, it's uh, uh, about 10 nanometers uh, nanoparticle, the efficiency uh, will be very low, so like 10 to minus three or 10 to minus four. And we can uh, this. Uh, let me have a look at uh, more detailed at these curves. 
So the red one correspond to the numerical simulation and blue one correspond to analytical one. This uh, maximum correspond to the some resonance in this particle, yeah, uh, electric and magnetic. And this region of where the dipole approximation works well, we see quite good uh, coincidence of the curves. But here in this region below the uh, 800 nanometers, we see the some uh, sharp peak in numerical simulation, but there is no such a peak in uh, in analytical model. And this peak correspond to the uh, just quadrupole resonance of of uh, silicon particle. So, uh, in in this it means that in this region that the dipole moment doesn't work. Okay. Uh, what about plasmonic particle? The uh, dashed cur curves uh, correspond to the plasmonic particles, and uh, this uh, red one correspond to the uh, numerical model and blue one to analytical model. And one can see that uh, the electric particle excites SPP more efficiently than, uh, than plasmonic one. So efficiency uh, measured uh, in a geometrical cross-section is bigger. So, so the, the conclusion is that uh, the electric particle is more efficient for excitation of SPP. Okay. Then uh, the second part is uh, uh, about the steering. Now we show the uh, demultiplexing. Uh, before we show the demultiplexing of SPP, and demultiplexing bandwidth is 45 nanometers. But in the, um, for demultiplexing, we consider only the TM polarized wave. So we fixed the polarization, we fixed angle of incidence, and we change only the wavelength of the incident light. Um, okay, I have a question from, from Maxim. Let me read it. What is the origin of so large discrepancies in dipole model for full wave simulation for plasmonic particle? Yes, Maxim, thank you for this question. <clears throat> uh, this uh, this uh, mismatching between the numerical and analytical models in the dipole approximation. This <clears throat> difference is come from the uh, hot spot, actually, between uh, between the uh, uh, plasmonic particles and substrate, so we see the strong localization of the field here near the uh, near the uh, particle, and efficiently in numerical simulations, uh, the uh, kind of center of mass of my particle is closer to the substrate. So, because it's a question, if you would like to replace the particle of finite size by a point dipole, in uh, in which place of the space you need to place this point dipole? In the center of the sphere or near the substrate? And actually, this, this, this question uh, has not unique answer. This is, this is a, uh, it's a question of what you would like to analyze. In order to have a matching between this analytical and numerical model, we need just uh, to place the point dipole closer to my, uh, closer to my substrate. In this case, uh, I will have uh, better matching. So the question uh, or comment from uh, Konstantin Simovsky, this effect is described in our papers on, on scale substrate induced bionisotropy. Konstantin, if you will provide, I think the, the reference in the chat, it will be great. Mm -hmm. So, but for, uh, for dipole particle, there is no such a pronounced hotspot. It, it is, but it's not so pronounced as for plasmonic one, not so strong localization of the field. And it is, it is the reason of this uh, mismatching between numerical model and analytical one. So, and, and the, second, uh, the second idea was, guys, so uh, as we know uh, in the previous works, it's possible to excite SPP to the left side of this, uh, uh, from the slit to the right side, uh, changing the uh, polarization of incident light from left to right uh, circular polarized light. And we, in the second step, we try to use the polarization degree of freedom of incident light. So uh, let's try to use not only uh, p polarized wave uh, as an incident one, let's try to use maybe uh, arbitrary uh, polarization state of incident light. And in this case, we'll try to reach uh, the steering of SPP excitation to provide full angular control of excitation of, S of SPP, changing the polarization of incident light and changing the uh, incident wave, uh, wavelength of the incident light. These two parameters, 
polarization state and wave length. So this is the main idea. Again, so this is the same antenna. This is a plane of incidence. And this is a polarization ellipse of the incident light. So in general case, uh, it could, uh, the uh, axis of this ellipse could, could be rotated somehow with respect to the plane of incidence. So we have a lot of uh, degree of freedom, but we have analytical model. And this analytical model uh, helps us uh, to find the optimal condition for maximal directivity in certain direction. So what, 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 what we did exactly? We fixed some direction characterized by azimuthal angle phi, like this one. And then we will provide some optimization. We will try to find the optimal wavelength and optimal polarization state of incident light in order to have maximal directivity in dipole approximation in this certain direction. Okay, uh, and this is a result of the simulation. Let me show you. Uh, so uh, this blue curve corresponds to the uh, directivity of uh, SPP. So uh, and uh, different uh, different position or the different uh, uh, figures, different orientation uh, corresponds to the different wavelength and different polarization state of the light. And one can see that it's possible to find the uh, optimal wavelength and optimal polarization state at the fixed angle of incidence. In our case, angle of incidence and 25 degree here. In order to have uh, almost maximal possible uh, directivity in dipole approximation in any direction of propagation. So in this case, in any direction, we reach directivity in dipole approximation more than 2.7. So, and let me uh, analyze this more detail, this polarization state and wavelength. So this is a polarization state correspo corresponding to the maximal directivity in a certain direction. So in order to have, of course, forward or backward, uh, uh, maximal forward, maximal backward directivity, we need to use the linear polarized light. In order to have the maximal left or right, uh, uh, directivity to the left or the right uh, directions, we need to use some kind of uh, elliptical polarization state and the uh, the main axis uh, of this uh, ellipse would be rotated a little bit with respect to the plane of incidence. Okay. Uh, of course, we generalized, in order to, 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 to solve this problem, we generalized uh, our, our formula. This formula actually is so-called generalized Kerker condition for uh, for the domain of surface wave, yeah? Uh, and in this case, you will see that uh, not only uh, the mx and y to two components of the, uh, of the magnetic dipole moments uh, contribute to SPP and three components of the, uh, of the uh, electric dipoles. So we have quite uh, uh, complicated picture because we have one, two, three, four, five complex parameters and, and the frequency, so it's, uh, and we provide this optimization and I will show the result of the optimization. This is the map. Uh, this left part of this map, uh, the, the color corresponds to the directivity, it's from zero to three. This is angle of incidence. This is uh, uh, the horizontal axis this is the azimuthal angle, so this propagation direction of SPP. Uh, for example, if I choose some point, for example, let me choose this point. This point corresponds to the angle 90 degree, so it means it's uh, uh, excitation of SPP in the left direction. And in order to have the maximal uh, directivity for the left excitation, I need uh, to choose the uh, angle of incidence you see around 35 degree, this uh, dash curve corresponds to the maximal possible value equal to three. So uh, wave uh, incident angle is 35 degree. This is a polarization state here. So here, but what is the wavelength? And in order to find the wavelengths, uh, we show the uh, second half of this map. And, and this second half of this map, color correspond to the wavelength. So I need to, to take the symmetric point from this map like here. So, and, uh, and here you see this is a, a some uh, yellow greenish 
something like here, it's, it's about 900 nanometers. So it means that to, in order to, uh, to have the maximal directivity to, uh, to the left direction, you need to take angle of incidence 35 degree and uh, angle of incidence uh, and wavelength around 900 nanometers. So this is a result of uh, analytical optimization. So, okay, uh, let me show this beautiful video. So uh, when I will uh, start in this uh, panel corresponds, uh, so I have a question from Alek Irmakov. What is the particle radius here? The same, Alek. Uh, the uh, r radius of the particle uh, in, in this uh, 300 nanometers. We, uh, we take it because it's quite close to the, uh, our experiment, okay? So uh, this panel will show the uh, polarization ellipse of the incident light, yeah? Uh, angle of incidence is fixed, it's 25 degree. This will be correspond, uh, this show the directivity pattern. Uh, this is a radial component of the pointing vector, and this is a uh, azimuthal component of magnetic field, so absolute value. So let me start this video. So we will change the wavelength here. So uh, and we will choose the parameters providing the maximal uh, maximal uh, directivity. So you can see the wavelengths for the uh, optim for the uh, optimal uh, directivity polarization state and you, you can see how it looks like the directivity of SPP. You also can see the uh, radial component of the pointing vector and field uh, distribution. This is also a result of analytical approximation. But we will check uh, this, uh, uh, cross-check this analytical model again with the numerical simulations. There is some discrepancies but uh, uh, it uh, analytical model uh, works well in dipole approximation. Okay. Uh, and this is our, uh, I think, final result. Uh, this is a uh, comparison of the experimental data and numerical results. So in experiment, uh, we, uh, it's, it was quite difficult to, to change, uh, to manipulate with polarization state. And we will show that steering is possible even for circular polarized wave. It's not uh, so efficient, so the, the, the maximal directivity uh, doesn't reach the maximal value number three, but we will see uh, uh, for the circular polarized wave, uh, we can change only the wavelength and we will see the beautiful steering of uh, SPP. So it means we, we can reach the steering, not with the maximal directivity, yeah, but steering, uh, changing only the wavelength when the polarization state of the incident light uh, is circularly polarized. So this is, uh, solid curve is an analytical model and a blue curve, this is a uh, experimental results. Okay, so uh, this is a summary of my talk. So it means that even the uh, single sub-wavelength uh, all the electric particles with high refractive index could be used for efficient and controllable excitation of surface plasma polaritons and actually and other uh, gui guided waves. And it's possible to realize uh, demultiplexing uh, using this single nanoparticle and uh, demultiplexing band width will be less than 50 nanometers in the near infrared region. Yeah. And uh, using and playing with the polarization state of the incident light, it is possible to provide full angular control of SPP excitation. It's also uh, it's possible to reach the maximal possible directivity in dipole approximation. So, and these uh, uh, results are published in two main papers uh, in the, uh, 2017 and uh, uh, 2020 in uh, laser photonics reviews and in ACS photonics journal. Okay, I have some comments, I think, from Konstantin Simovsky. Let me have a look. Oh, this is just Konstantin Simovsky provided uh, some references. Okay, thank you, Konstantin. Guys, please have a look. Uh, okay, and uh, of course, this work uh, wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, a great contribution uh, of, uh, of great team. So this is our 
I'm very pleased to highlight that all, uh, all the results of this work uh, were obtained in Itmo University. So it's a theoretical model uh, and uh, fabrication of particle, this play, uh, pick and place technique, uh, and ex all experimental measurements, measurements were done in our optical lab. And especially I would like uh, to, to thank Ivan Sinov, uh, who made a great contribution to, to, to this work. And the, in, in, in theory, in, in experiment, uh, in, in writing, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so this is a, I think this is a good example of the uh, tight collaboration between uh, theoreticians, uh, experimentalists, and technologists. So, and if I have uh, one more minute, I would like uh, to announce the Meta Nana Summer School. And uh, this year, uh, the school will be uh, in online format from the 6th to 10th July. Yeah, and uh, uh, the deadline is, is extended, is up to 1st June, and participation is free. And the, uh, this year, this uh, school uh, will be topical, and the topic of this school is uh, scattering problems in photonics. So there are great lectures. The uh, school will be organized as a single course uh, based uh, on the principle from the simplest things uh, to the uh, uh, cutting edge achievements. Uh, so please welcome, uh, see our website and join our school. Okay, dear colleagues, thank you for your attention. I, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Andrei. So, by the way, Andrei, there's a comment from uh, Konstantin Simovsky in the chat. Uh, let me, okay, let, let me have a look. Let me have a look. So, please Fast feel free to ask questions. Sean Bolt. Uh, Konstantin, could you anno anno announce uh, your, your, your question or comments orally? Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, you reported both uh, demultiplexing and multiplexing. Uh, here, uh, the re reciprocity theorem uh, can uh, reduce to just a simple inversion of the direction of all wave yes. vectors. Uh, so both uh, demultiplexer and multiplexer are described in these papers. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, Konstantin, for, for this comment. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Andre, could you please, uh, I'll ask, well, uh, everybody's thinking, yeah, could you please comment on the shape of the uh, excitation efficiency of those surface plasmas? So why do we have a single peak there and uh, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. So, uh, let me hear, here you mean this. So yeah. as a, uh, what is this, this peak? Yeah, this peak responds to, to the fundamental resonance of my, of my, my particle. And this, this is a kind of a magnetic, vertical magnetic dipole resonance. Uh, uh, and the substrate actually is modified it a little bit and the particle enhanced the uh, uh, vertical magnetic dipole resonance because it's plasmonic, it's described in, uh, in uh, also in uh, uh, our paper uh, published in uh, 2017, as I remember, so 2016. Andre, it's not vertical magnetic dipole. It's lateral. <laughs> vertical doesn't couple to plasma. TM wave. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's it's not exact. It's uh, yeah. It's it's a lateral electric dipole resonance. It's it means yeah. I'm sorry, Ivan. Is it true? Yeah. Magnetic, magnetic, Andre. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, a vertical magnetic dipole resonance doesn't result in excitation of SPP at all. So this is a uh, horizontal, this is a fundamental, re in, in our case, fundamental resonance is horizontal uh, magnetic dipole resonance. And this is uh, just because of the resonance behavior of the particle, I have this resonance in, uh, in excitation efficiency. So can we conclude that the in-plane magnetic dipole is more efficient for for excitation of surface waves. Yes, if we're talking about the efficiency, yes. It makes the, the, the dominant contribution to the efficiency. Okay, and some questions in the chat. So Artem is asking, uh, so is he right that by changing polarization state, we change the orientation of magnetic and electric dipoles in space? Okay, uh, I'm ready. 
in space but yeah we, we change the uh, the the ratio between the components of the electric and magnetic dipole resonance we change uh, changing the polarization states uh, we change uh, the relative phases between the different components of the resonances and we change uh, the uh, their ratio so so we, we could uh, if you have a look at let me at this formula okay let me just a moment here so changing the, the polarization state we could uh in the oh, not almost independently but more or less we could uh, uh independently change the uh, values of, of different components of uh, electric and magnetic dipole resonances of course they're connected but we have some degree of freedom but you have to keep in mind that those components uh, already account for the substrate. So it's not just me response of a single particle in a vacuum, but uh, so the bionisotropy effects are also accounted, by the way. Yes, this is a, a, a effective dipole mo moments accounting the interaction with the substrate. I have also the, the question from Alexandra Furasova. Uh, uh, the real particles have not ideal shapes. What is the difference between uh, uh, the sphere and ellipse shape. So the difference. So you're absolutely right, Sasha, that the uh, the, sh uh, the shapes uh, and size uh, does matter in in this case. So uh, the shapes uh, of the particle affect the ratio between different uh, components of uh, resonances. So and as I told. Uh, the it for example it uh, can affect the spectral dependencies of directivity like here uh, like here so because you will see that if we change the shape uh, we change this uh, the uh, value of pz uh, of ver vertical uh, electric dipole moment and uh, the dependence could could look uh, more narrow or more broader for for different shapes for example, even even Sinov well, provided some optimization, so we consider not only sphere like, like a cylinder, and uh, if it's a cylinder, uh, maybe Ivan can correct me. Is as I remember, it's possible to reach a more narrow band width for the multiplexing around like 20 nanometers, something yeah. like, this. Something like yeah. this. So play, playing with the shape. So this is a not optimal actually like, geometry for the multiplexing. So it's it's possible to to have more narrow band width. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, then you may want to ask questions in person. Before we thank Andre, so for that I propose you switch your microphones to make the applause. Uh, I would first like to announce that, again, uh, look after our YouTube channel where we put all the videos. Uh, with the some delay, we also have an uh, events events web page on the website where we have all the talks from all the seminars and the links to some of them. Um, and you may also want to subscribe to have the update to keep up uh, to be updated on our seminars. This is especially uh, especially important for those uh, who are not the employees of our department. So uh, let us uh, thank Andre. Andre, thank you very much for a very nice talk. I'm making the applause. And thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, before we finish, I would like to announce that the next optical seminar will be held next Friday. Uh, it will be given by Dr. Daniel Sapori uh, of Institute de Rene France. Uh, he will be talking about two-dimensional perovskites, uh, so which might be very interesting for broad audience. So you're very welcome. It will be on uh, May 29th. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, and see you next time. <laughs>